One of the most fun new augments in TFT Inkborn Fables is Fine Vintage. This augment allows you to transform completed items into support items. And the best Chinese chefs have been in the kitchen cooking up some really interesting compositions. In this episode of Into Deep, we're going to hop on board with the CN Go Juan Mei to show just exactly what he's cooking up with Void Spawns as the carry and all the other champions being target dummies. Heavenly actually gives the buffs to the void spawns, and so now they become the star of the composition, while all the other units are support. After this video, I have no doubt you're going to try to queue it up immediately and try to play this comp for yourself, because it is quite meme and also quite OP. If you don't want to just remember this video and you want a company guide, you can check out tftacademy.com, where we have things like this fine vintage comp, and it shows a little bit of a snapshot, including like what you're looking for early, your carousel priority, and this uh, smattering of positioning options. The reason why we're doing it like this is because it kind of depends on what combo you hit. I'll cover it a little bit more in this video, but you know, depending on what pairing you have of support items like Locket and Zeke's versus Aegis and Randuins kind of changes based on what you're hitting. Let's go ahead and jump into the video because I have a couple of slides to boil this down and simplify it further as we're watching so it makes more sense. Juan Mei is a player that shouldn't need much of an introduction, but in case you haven't met him yet, he is considered to be the greatest player from China in our short history of competitive TFT. He's hit rank one dozens of times by now, and he's also a world champion, having made four world finals in a row from set four all the way to set seven, a streak that is yet to be broken. And also has won even recently, right? The PBE Masters Tournament, which had one of the most stacked fields ever. It was basically like a world championship caliber field. Was playing a PBE tournament just a couple weeks ago, and he won that. So he's a very accomplished tournament player. We're starting off on three cost champion as the portal. We start off with the Lowey. Not terribly impressive early. Lowey used to be a lot stronger, but they nerfed her. And now she's no longer as dominant as she was at the middle stages of PBE. Uh, unfortunately, we saw a Kha'Zix come out of the orb and we didn't sell the Alawi fast enough to buy the Kha'Zix 2 in shop. And that's something that is somewhat of a direct punish for not selling the Alawi a little bit quicker. But hey, you can't even blame yourself. If anything, maybe it's a little bit encouraging sign to show that even a world champion messes that up from time to time. And that's not necessarily anybody's fault. I guess it's more dog's fault, maybe a little bit. So we're going to hold on to a bunch of pairs and see what the augment has to offer us. So right away, we have a couple of interesting, powerful choices. We got Pick of the Litter, Branching Out, and Band of Thieves. We already know what augment he's going to pick at 2-1. It's going to be Fine Vintage, because that's the whole purpose of this video. But let's go ahead and walk through it anyways, just to kind of talk about a little bit about the early game trade-offs. Pick of the Litter is a really powerful tempo-based augment that also acts as a little bit of resource and economy. The tempo is that you're able to get a pair of three costs, and you're able to get direction really early. And so if you pick it, and let's say you find a really powerful three cost AP carry to play around with this rod tier and belt. You can lean into that immediately and have an excuse to just kind of go for a reroll. On this patch, for example, you would look and pick things like pick a litter for Bard or Aphelios, some really powerful three cost. The other option you can use for pick a litter is to try to go for fortune fishing, but that's very unlikely. There are 13 three costs and finding two out of them is unlikely. And so, yeah, maybe you could try going fishing for fortune, but uh, pretty unlikely that you hit. Branching out is if you also want direction. I mean, this is what we did a lot in set nine back when we had legends. Uh, sorry to bring back trauma if you didn't like legends. I know a lot of people did actually like it, so it's not that big of a deal. Branching out gives you an emblem. You play around that emblem. A lot of easy direction, kind of like Wandering Trainer. Band of Thieves is the best silver augment here. Offers a lot of tempo. Just gives you items onto a two-star champion that you're willing to sell or even just play as your best board. A lot of times, Band of Thieves ends up being played on a frontline unit because they want those kind of stats. And, you know, it's a little bit of a trade-off. Like, if they get a carry items, you can put them a little bit farther back. But you don't want to put your backline carry units in the front if they get a tank item. Interestingly enough, I think the one thing that is worth noting is that Juan May actually rolled Band of Thieves out of all of them and was thinking about taking branching out that's really interesting in a note in itself because i would have prioritized band of thieves but he clearly takes branching out and the data suggests that band of thieves is much better triforce is a little bit too early to commit to that right now because we sold our three cost if it was a good three cost like bard to start things off or Philios, maybe you can pick that but we're gonna go ahead and pick fine vintage because that's the whole point of this video let's do it and wow right away we get offered a pair of headlings across the board we got malphite pair kha'zix pair and kiana pair so uh looking good so far and juan may already has made an item and sold that item to be put on his bench this is not gonna be something that he plays for tempo which actually brings us to a really important slide that i want to show to establish the game plan of what we're going to be doing for the stage. So to start things off in stage two, you want to play your strongest board around Heavenly. It is important to collect Heavenly units, even if they're not part of your strongest board, because it's going to be a lot harder to hit things like Kha'Zix and Malphite later in the game at levels seven, eight, and nine. 
I know a lot of people who sell it and just say, hey, look, I'll pick it up later because it's not part of my strongest board and I want to go for economy. But at least try to hold on to one of them if you can, because it's really important that you have access to them. Two costs, you probably can sell like Nico and Kiana, but one cost are a little bit hard to find later. This is a standard leveling tempo, but at the same time, you can break the rules as well. Like if you are win streaking, you can go to level six a little earlier, like at the beginning of stage three. Maybe you go to seven at three, five, maybe you go eight by four, two. These are all kind of like open-ended. And when you ain't able to push these levels, uh, kind of depends on how the game state is going. Play strong openers with Heavenly. The three most common trades that you'll see are Faded because you have access to things like Yasuo and Ari, which are also one cost. And then Kindred can kind of tie in that Heavenly with Kha'Zix. Duelists, which is Kiana linking to Darius. Darius 2 is very, very good as well as Yasuo. And then Umbral, because if you're able to get Umbral for shielding early, that synergizes really well. And you have Yone with the Reaper that can tie in with Kha'Zix. And that could be a powerful opener as well. Leave completed items on the bench. I know it's painful. You might feel like you have like a Rage Blade or some other really good item that you love to play early. Just leave it on the bench for three rounds. I promise you to be worth it. I will say one thing though. You still want to make sure you have anti-heal options later on. If you turn everything into a support item, you can have access to anti-armor and anti-magic resistance through Obsidian Cleaver, but you won't have things like anti-heal. And that's Morello, Red Buff, as well as a Sunfire. So you want to make sure you have at least one of those three things later on. Stage three, open your support anvils. We're aiming for two to four ZZ Rot portals. If you have only one, you got to pivot. I don't think you can actually make it work with just one ZZ Rot, sadly enough. And you have to pivot into just kind of playing like a Heavenly Morgana Kane or some other Heavenly Warrior, which we've covered in our previous tier list video. And then also, if you do have a lot of pairs, don't just like greed and be like, I'm Kha'Zix 1, Malphite 1, Kiana 1, Nico 1, and I'm just going to greed all the way to stage 4 and never roll. If you do that, you're probably going to take too much damage because your Heavenly stats upgrade based on your star level. Stages 4 and 5, push levels, and then transition from a 3 slash 4 cost carry over to a 5 cost. Always play around Irelia, Lissandra, and Wukong. If you have those units, play them, even if they're 1 cost and you're replacing 2-star units. And you can also play some other really good support ones or temporary carries. Huey is just always good. He's very OP right now. Zir is good single target burst and maybe a placeholder until you hit Irelia. And then Rakan has amazing traits, quite possibly just the best trait bot in the game, and also surprisingly does a good amount of damage. Back over this video, it looks like we lost our first fight because we're holding so many pairs, and our encounter is Tristana, which gives us more gold. Gold is actually nice because we ultimately want to get to level 9 as fast as we can because we're playing around 5 costs, and it's really hard to reliably hit those 5 costs at level 8. Hit a Malphite too, that's pretty good. And I do think that we should probably just make 10 here. So probably sell like the Cho'Gath pair. It's not particularly good, but you kind of notice how he's collecting and holding all these pairs to maintain his tempo as best as he can. Oh, interesting. So he holds on to the Cho'Gath pair and sells Yasuo and doesn't want to play around that Duelist there. That's interesting. I guess because he already has the Darius pair, it feels like that Duelist pairing is good enough. And you can pair this for the Behemoths with the Malphite. That makes sense. And ends up getting a win, so now he probably wants to transition towards trying to win as much as he can. TFT is a game of momentum. You don't want to just kind of win-loss, win-loss. If you do, you end up kind of being in the middle, which is the worst part. We hit a Kha'Zix too, so that's also really good. And now we sold everything else to make 20. And this makes sense because he's going to be stuck on this board for a while. And the next unit that he wants to play is not going to be for a few rounds. So he might as well just prioritize making gold right now and kind of selling off and making econ. And this right here is a really good example of some things that top players do very subtly of when to hold units versus when to sell them to make economy. So if you watch enough of those kinds of play patterns, just keep watching them do things like that. It'll start to make sense intuitively of like, okay, I can actually play this unit for like three whole rounds. And that's potentially one, two, three more interest gold, which is helping me make 30, 40, 50 that much quicker. So it's very subtle things like that of why top players are making more econ than you. It doesn't really matter what Juan may picks right now on the carousel. He could pick any item and transform it, but he could also use his pick to grief his opponent. If he knows that, for example, someone really wants to team with a tier, he could be trying to interfere with their game plan. Makes the blue buff and sells it. And here's our first support anvil. And we hit a ZZ Rot portal. So no questions asked. Just going to go ahead and grab that. And the nice thing about the ZZ Rot is that it already benefits from the stats from Heavenly. So we already have three Heavenly giving extra AD from Kiana, extra crit from Kha'Zix, as well as these extra resistances from Alpha. Placing the ZZ Rod in the Umbral so he gets a little bit more shielding and into the action. I like this as opposed to putting ZZ Rod in the back. A lot of people try to get full Umbral value and greeting, but at the same time, that means that it's going to be a little bit delayed 
And the trade-off for having Caesar on the back isn't worth it at all. Coming up on the next encounter, what will it be? Soraka, which is offering a support item. And immediately we get a second ZZ Rot, which is uh, already a pretty high roll, <laughs> to say the least. But hey, we said that we want to play around the double ZZ Rot condition. Uh, so we are good to go and we can kind of commit to this right now and play around, find vintage with a bunch of support items. And so pretty much at this point, we're going to convert any items we get immediately onto the bench. There is a small little important thing to note. This round does count for fine vintage, so you want to combine it and sell it to get onto the bench ASAP and then get that one round banked in. If he started at 3-1, he would get it at 3-4, but because of this, he gets it now at 3-3. I guess 3-4 is technically a carousel, so not necessarily true. Okay, so now we get our first support anvil choice that doesn't have a ZZ Rot. So let's go ahead and pull up our tier list to show you exactly what we're looking for. Here is the support item tier list that you're trying to play for fine vintage. At the top priority, it's just as many ZZ Rot portals as you can possibly get up to four. Our priority two are things that buff void spawns with a bunch of auras. But the caveat to that is you want to have combos that make sense. You want Randuins and Aegis because of the way they're positioning. They kind of help clumps or Lockets and Zeeks because they help rows. And so this is important to note because if you end up mixing and matching because you're like, wait, Aegis is statistically the best performing one, but then I'm going to take like a Locket and a Zeke's, you're going to realize you put yourself in some awkward positions where uh, you're not going to be able to get like max max value on both. And that's going to feel really bad. And so try to lean into one or the other if it makes sense. Priority three are luxury items, things like Needlessly Big Gem, which is uh, really good to have one of. I don't think you really need more than one. If you do, you're probably greeting a little bit too hard, especially because it doesn't give gold anymore. They nerfed that part of it. It used to give gem at the 15 second mark, but no longer does it. I don't know why I included Chalice of Power here. Honestly, I think it's kind of weak, so probably not. It's just nice to put it on the rest of your heavenly units or onto your backline units if you end up playing someone that's relevant like a Huey or an Azir. Shroud of Stillness and Zephyr are really just good utility. They're always nice to have, like they're never bad to have uh, because Zephyr can shut down the carries or frontline solo tank. And Shroud of Stillness is just good to delay casts and also the team wide buffs are kind of nice. And so going back into what Juan May is picking here, he has one choice, which is Locket of the Iron Solari because everything else doesn't really give direct buffs. And yeah, maybe you could justify taking something like the Martyr because you want to buff your whole team's health. This makes a lot more sense currently right now. And so now Juan May is just playing overwhelming amount of stats and tempo. He has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven units on the board versus his opponents five, six, I guess, because you count Kale. And there's just too many things things on the board that have too many auras and just way too much hp it's an overwhelming stat train right now that can't be stopped and because he also upgraded a couple of heavenly units early he's good to go Let's take a look at the augments here at three two misconnections which you get one of everything at one cost which is not important it could be better if he was on like kha'zix pair and malphite pair but we don't need it team building kind of the same thing we don't really need two stars right now so i think we can go ahead and roll that partial ascension is actually really good we talked about like you know how easily big gem after 15 seconds gives you that 30 percent bonus damage this basically does exactly that so it's kind of like getting not a full gem but uh, a good amount of it Rerolls option one and two and has a really interesting option in late game specialist late game specialist says when you hit level nine you get 33 gold and this is silver veil which says that you block the first form of cc from the enemy and you get five percent attack speed this is good for a lot of melee comps but i don't think it's actually as strong as the other two options you would go for parcel ascension because you just want combat power and this means that he doesn't have to pick gem later on in some ways and then this is like well i want to hit those five costs like i really and lissandra so this is like you know i want to try to make sure i can guarantee and get that I think I like Partial Ascension the most, though. Okay, Partial Ascension it is. And now we find another Behemoth. We level to play it immediately. Kind of feel like another Duelist makes sense. That's exactly what he's doing right now. Only because it doesn't feel like we have enough melee space. Something to think about is that these Void Spawns do end up crowding each other. Positioning this can be complicated due to how many melee champions you have. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That takes up the entire front row. And if your opponent has an equally spread out front line, there's a chance that you actually don't have your melee units go up to the front and your void spawns are just way in the back. And that's a big deal because it might waste things like locket buffs or other things that are temporary. Okay, so we get our another support anvil. And okay, this is uh, one of those that aren't great uh, across the board. Uh, in terms of hitting the priority one or prior two, we would rather take a third ZZ rod than a lot of this. 
but you could justify taking shroud it's generically good if you want to just go for the five unit row uh hex type of affecting thing you can just take a chalice as well but i think shroud makes the most sense ah he took a virtue of the martyr okay so this is playing into partial ascension and also viable right like these are uh, support items that he wasn't like incredibly happy to take so uh it's interesting he didn't take chalice and i think that makes sense because zero not actually casting a lot and chalice is more for like the other actual units like the heavenlies themselves um or the actual champions not as easy rod so he's just trying to lean into partial ascension and you know what maybe that makes me move things like chalice of power down in my tier list as well so hey i'm learning stuff too we end up taking a loss here to duelists uh duelists can be pretty strong to deal with in the mid game and we don't have enough damage so it's kind of the problem with something like virtue of the martyr is that uh it's a little bit slow and i think some of the trade-off of this is that he doesn't actually get a lot of power instead of taking something like shroud or chalice which is just straight up more combat power i will say though virtue of the martyr affects the entire team so one thing about it is that it affects more units as you go on things like chalice of power and shroud have a limit to how many units that they can affect and taking a reaper try to see if we can play as greedy as we possibly can we're not leveling here it's actually really cheap to level because if he spent 32 right now, he'd be at 45 and probably possibly could make 50. So it's uh, almost like a free level, but he's not on a streak. So it doesn't feel like he needs to actually push levels right here to preserve that win streak. If you don't have the level and you can even save that one extra gold, that can be valuable for a player like Juan May. So it looks like he's trying to agree just a little bit more. Levels off Cadence now that he's above 50. Even though he's 2 out of 48, it's not a clean interval. He says it's free. This one is 100% free because he knows he's going to skip level 7 and try to go at least to level 8 directly. And this is actually a really important thing because a lot of people who are re-rolling sometimes do this. And they say, okay, well, it's a free level. But by the time you start rolling your gold, you're going to be 6 out of 48 because you have to wait with this round and then wait the, for the, the creep rounds at the end of stage 3 and that's six gold you could have potentially put towards rolling instead i guess not actually full six because it is technically off cadence but you get what i mean looks like we're going up against a yone two board which is fighting for tempo and his opponent's also by the way playing fine vintage so a lot of players are trying to go for this type of strategy we'll see if the fine vintage yone board stacking a bunch of things like aegis is going to be really really good in fact scanning around the board there's a lot of high tempo boards in general so uh the fact that he's pairing well against things like tempo duelist or against people who are hitting a bunch of two star three costs early uh bows very well for this comp again trying to make items as fast as he can so he can sell it was waiting to see what would drop out of those orbs kept the unit on the bench he knew he was going to sell now he can tech in soraka at seven not holding on to any of these four costs still just relying on the zz rots to carry going up against a bard composition bard without a rage blade wow that's actually really unlucky his opponent has over encumbered which is a get components for uh having only two bench slots for a stage and doesn't have rage blade but it looks like his opponent has six bards with the bard two on the bench as well so i guess uh you win some you lose some and speaking of lose some looks like we barely lose this fight good loss though and that's a uh, really excellent for Juan May. he's not holding on to things like Lilia doesn't really need to hold around that four cost that's not what the core game plan is or to augment jeweled lotus freaky friday or call to chaos jeweled lotus three again our voice bonds don't cast anything so it, jeweled lotus would just be for the crit strike on the headbutt uh, th i guess that'd be funny if that was the case but uh, i don't think these are particularly good call to chaos is always okay to take i actually think that this augment is not only fun but like also generically okay to take in spots where you don't know what to do also there's a couple of rewards specifically that call to chaos is really good at on tf hub there is a game resources tab that kind of shows you like all different cash outs and stuff like this call the chaos says gain a powerful reward and a random reward and the random reward is also just generically kind of good across the board if you get gold that's good so you can level and try to roll for stuff if you get experience that's good because you can level and roll for stuff 40 shop refresh that do not expire this one's kind of mid because you don't want to roll yet so you have to kind of wait for it this is really good for like three cost reroll but the double zeke's the double locket excellent Triple Sniper's Focus means that our backline carry will have items, although I guess the downside of it is that we don't get support items and items to reforge. Hull Crusher, this one's pretty bad. I don't think I want this one at all, especially because we have so many ZZ Rots and it's going to get crowded, so 10% of just like a straight-up failure. Random 3-star, three 3-cost three champion, uh, which is, what, 29 gold plus 10 gold, so kind of a much worse version of this. This is also quite poor, so I would hope that we don't get this. Although, there's a chance that you hit, like, Soraka 3 out of nowhere. That'd be dope. These gloves plus manic air remover, those are three these gloves that can transform into support items. So 
Not bad at all. And then four random emblems plus Night Night Reaver. So that's a miss. So overall, I would say three misses, five hits, and two okay-ish results. I think that's pretty decent, but... Hey, maybe I'm just a little bit too optimistic about it. He rolls options one and two, but Prismatic Ticket and Cybernetic Uplink don't change anything. So it looks like we're going to go for Call to Chaos and see what we get. Okay, it looks like he got the infinite gold option. I mean, not infinite gold, but he is very rich to the point where he's just straight up going to nine and going to start rolling now. So basically, uh, he got a Prismatic to just help skip level eight. And now he rolls, hits Irelia and Huey and hits Irelia too. I mean, this is so high roll, but that's kind of what Call of Chaos enables, right? It gives you these really big spikes. And quite frankly, if he also hit like the, the other like Zeke's and the Zizra stuff, it also could have been really, really insane for him. But not quite like this, where he hit Irelia 2 immediately. This is bananas. In before another, ah, oh, this is about as useless because he's high rolling too much. But I mean, I think this whole, this, the whole point is to show you how the game plan kind of comes together. Udyr gives you a choice between what kind of items, so he can pick attack, defense, or magic. Doesn't really matter. He can just kind of choose these items and reforge them. He does have Irelia too, so he has the option of actually going for an Irelian item right now. So opens a support anvil. Going back to what we talked about before, yes, Randuin's could theoretically be really good, but it kind of hamstrings a lot of his positioning. And so he's also thinking about whether or not he wants to take something like gem or a shroud. As we mentioned before, one gem is also really good. And he doesn't need Obsidian Cleaver because Irelia actually sunders for herself. So the only reason you'll be taking Obsidian Cleaver is to help Huey do more damage. And that's not that big of a deal. Okay, looks like we go for gem. Gem on Huey because we're probably going to itemize Irelia later on. I like that. Gem also gives a little bit of more HP to the unit that's holding it. So Huey has a little bit more survivability. We're not actually locket buffing the Void Spawn on the far left in A1. So I'm actually a little surprised by that positioning. I think probably just too much going on, right? He had to level, he had to roll. He's thinking about his items and wasn't really paying that close attention to his positioning. But it's not really like it's going to matter. That extra shielding didn't really punish him really right now. And that's okay. He's last pick on Carousel. There's Lissandra, but I don't think we're going to get it. He could start thinking about whether or not he wants to start taking anti-heal components because he's at the point of the game where he pretty much has like everything that he has at its core, which is multiple Zizarots and a couple of support aura items. So maybe he wants to start thinking about potentially making a uh, Rayleigh items or a anti-heal option. Now fixes his positioning so he can have the Void Spawns into the Locket Taunt. Text in a cane so we can get just a little bit more oomph onto the board by having a Reaper in. The way you can think about these voice bonds is that they are super tanks and they can deal a lot of damage and carry. They'll be dealing as much damage as a secondary carry, like 2 to 3k, and also be tanking a ton. Assuming it lasts that long. These fights are not lasting that long at all. In fact, it feels like Jeb barely kicks in the fight's over. He's just toppling a lot of boards right now. We're also using Huey to print other legendaries. And it looks like we are committed to trying to go for a couple more support items here. Okay, next fight, it's Yone 3 with Trash of Treasure. No Orn items onto that Yone. But Yone is kind of scary because if he gets to our backline and kills Irelia, then we lose. And this is one of the ways to punish it. So if you're going up against this composition and you're thinking like, well, how do I actually be something like this? You have a unit like Yone, which can assassinate the backline and he's kind of scaling as the fight goes along. So uh, it does make it feel like you're playing into the Yone win condition. Comp's not infallible. But it is very, very strong. Does have some bad matchups, though. Support item time. And a third ZZ Rot. So we are going for the, the trifecta. The three ZZ Rots. Udyr is kind of awkward. He's a legendary you don't want to play because of melee. But uh, it looks like he's just going to play as an upgrade over King 1. I think that makes sense. But again, it's just one of those things that late game, it gets more and more awkward the more void spawns you have because... You just have fewer and fewer melee hexes for people to walk onto. Tries to min-max with the Gunblade again to get a another support item. Looks like he's going for full-on support items and not uh, an item for Irelia here, which is quite interesting. He's rolling down now at 9. He's not going to 10. And now he has Lissandra Pair, Rakan Pair, Huey Pair. Pops another support item anvil and finds a fourth ZZ Rot. But he... Did he get it in time? He did. Okay, so the ZZ Rot's now walking to the back line. Oh my god, the ZZ Rod's just on the carries like Bard, and Bard has to chew through so much. Yeah, Bard ends up sh throwing another Meep to another unit, but there's just so many units for the Meeps to attack. There's just way too many Void Spawns on the board, and Bard is getting overwhelmed at this point. Okay, we printed a Lissandra 2. We're not going to put items onto her. And the reason why Lissandra 2 is really good is that she can print more items to, you guessed it, get more support items and find vintage value. And now we finally put Juan May's 
Void spawns in the second row and our assembly is complete. What I like about it is that he didn't necessarily just default position like this immediately. He was trying to use Locket to get value with the two Void spawns. But now we're at the point where he can use the staggered positioning to kind of get that melee hex range value and also greed that support value as well man this duelist comp is really trying hard to get through oh my god do we have the dps to take down this udir oh my god it went down to ot that's really scary and maybe a reason why we need to prioritize anti-heal zeke's is actually one of the support as we talked about to kind of synergize and combo with each other but that fight right there is probably a demonstration of why anti-heal can be important uh so while you do want to get more support items uh you don't want to greed too much i think it's a product of juan may not actually like high rolling the support items in the right order so yes this game had high roll elements of it but one thing that he didn't high roll was like he hit only two void spawns early he kind of got some awkward items and eventually landed in the spot that he did just not in the right order and so he kept making support items until you could get like that you know critical mass of four void spawns and then the support items and now i think he probably wants to work on other things like anti-heal by the way that bar three did almost nothing in that previous fight not to mention that this combat at this point is uh is pretty trivialized you're just looking at what's going on and he's just dumpstering everything we have anti-heal option right there in morello oh god it's been taken uh okay i guess we are gonna play for a third support item at least a third aura support item i guess <laughs> Oh, one thing to know, by the way, yeah, sometimes these voice spawns are a little bit uh, glitchy where they keep resetting after each round. Uh, sometimes it might even show that you have like an additional one than you actually have. So just don't get baited by that. We're rolling for two stars and Huami made a new tier two. I wonder if he's actually going to play that. He doesn't really have space on this board because uh, he had to replace either Lissandra or Huey. He needs to keep the heavenly stats in because he wants to get all these buffs to the voids. And now this fight is so one-sided. And this is one of the stronger players in the lobby. And he, I think he just took out uh, another strong top CM player. So yeah, this game's starting to be a runaway. Seven Story Weaver. Man, he's just going through all the S tier comps. That person just hit Irelia too. Oh, interesting that the Seven Story Weaver, by the way, played uh, a different Kale line than usual. Ended up playing things like two blue scrolls and a green. All right, we're going up against that person. Wait, are we just going to wrap in the back? Our void spawns are immediately on the back line. Look at how fast it kills some of these one-star units. Oh, they died, but maybe we win anyways. Oh, it's actually kind of close. Nah, we don't have items on our Aurelia. On May, still going for more support items, by the way. Still refusing to itemize his Aurelia. I do think a couple of these fights could have been swung if we had like one or two items for Aurelia to kind of help deal with either like the super tanks or just have anti-heal. His opponent's Kale actually just did like a lot of damage and AoE things down. It's kind of crazy. Pop the item Anvil and we finally get an anti-heal option like Morello. And we pop our Anvil and I guess we don't have more lockets so we're gonna go for a second zeke's that's okay in this late game situation too i think you could just fight taking shroud and zephyr like if you zephyr snipe the irelia that is really really good and you have a bunch of backline uh spots to use it very good as well if you get the encounter malphite which gives you infinite remover uses so you can like bench a unit and keep benching zephyr and shroud and look at this fight's completely one-sided so the only person to beat us so far is the seven story weaver board here's a really interesting support anvil because we no longer have the ability to go for like a locket so we could just fight taking like an aegis and have aegis buffing like the right side of our board for example you could put aegis on here you can have aegis for example onto the malphite and then buff lissandra irelia plus two void spawns instead or you can go for like a, uh, a Zephyr and snipe the corner units as well, which I think is kind of what he was looking for before. We can also uh, push to level 10, but I think he's waiting right now because he has 57 health. Doesn't have to level up 10 immediately because he wants to go to 10 and have the ability to roll his gold for things like Wukong 2. Remember, star level does matter for your Heavenly. Not to mention that he's playing a Hui 1. Doesn't use a Zephyr. Uh, I don't know if that's because he felt like he was going to win. Sometimes you don't have to use Zephyr if you know you're going to win anyways. And so he might be saving it for the next fight. It is looking close, though. This Volo Bear is not dying. Oh, God. It was his ever diff. I mean, that's okay. He's learning the limits of his greed, which, uh, okay, if he hit Wukong 2 and Hui 2, that probably helps that previous fight. Probably turns into a win. I mean, this cop is just funny, man. Juanmei's just been sitting in the corner here giggling for like <laughs> the past 20 minutes because this this cop is also not only powerful, but it, it's hella meme isn't it? It's just, it's so troll. ZZRot's wrapped again to the back and they immediately killed the Zoe too. Oh, it's so funny, man.
and it deals half of Irelia's life. Oh my god! It like prepped it just enough for the Irelia splines on Huanli's side to go in and wipe everything. Okay, and that that should be the game. That's the person that beat us. I, I'm pretty sure there's no other strong unit that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with us. Can just take a full completed item. I'll take Gunblade here. Uh-oh. Uh, Swipe. We have an open vest. Maybe Bloodthirster? I don't know. Okay. We can go to 10 and uh, just kind of end it here. Level 10, play Udyr, and then just have, you know, Udyr 2 because he's just a good unit and Behemoth is kind of nice. At this point, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 units in just the front two rows. We have 14 units on the board. This is ridiculous. He's also going to cheese the Zephyr like a true rat. Oh my God. This comp truly has it all. <laughs> Oh, man, this is filthy. Oh, I guess we'll just win by 20 units. No big deal. Man, imagine if Void Spawns also counted for player damage. That would just be OP. So that's how you play Fine Vintage with Zizirath and Heavenly in a nutshell. Yeah, there were some highs and even higher highs that game in terms of uh, his luck factor. But I do think Kwame put a good demonstration of how to kind of play around with some of those support items in a really fun, meaningful way. So give it a try next time you're in that spot. That's it for this edition of In Too Deep, and I'll see you guys next time.